joining us, I'm Lynn Osborne from the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Health Care. Welcome to our Schwartz Center Office Hours webinar. We'll be our featured presentation shortly, but first a reminder. If you send us a question, please hold your cursor over the green tab found on the top of your screen and click the chat box. We'll answer as many questions as time permits during the session. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's session, Tom Wilson. She is our Senior Director of Development. She's devoted her entire career to nonprofit fundraising and management, after cutting her teeth, raising funds for the Boston University School of Education. She went on to managerial and fundraising positions at smaller nonprofits dedicated to education and communication. Reaching elementary age children, Blind children and adults, and now multidisciplinary clinicians. The session is building relationships with individuals who can help ensure the vibrancy and future of the Schwartz Center, as well as supporting her team members to achieve their personal and professional best. Tanya, welcome. And Pamela Mann, our Director of Programs and Rounds Training at the Schwartz Center. Pamela. Thank you. Before I turn the uh, mic over to Tanya, I just wanted to set the stage and uh, ditto what Lynn has already. We welcome all of today's participants. We have uh, folks from nearly 20 states who have been on today and uh, a prospective member from Canada. So welcome to all of you. In terms of why our topic today is creative ways to fund your short center membership. We want to recognize that we have heard that some of our member sites or prospective members have found that our initiation fees or ongoing membership fees are sometimes interpreted as challenges or obstacles. Uh, so that is why we wanted to take time to present some more information to help reframe um, that challenge and to help each of our members and our prospective members to think creatively how um, fees and the cost for being part of the Schwartz Center community is not a barrier. Yeah. Take it away. <laughs> Great, thank you. I'd love to turn our attention to the slide that uh, lists all of our topics for today, if I might. Um, so these are the six topics that we'd like to cover today. Um, and again, we appreciate so much that all of you are on the call, and we hope we can find a way to answer your questions as we get presentation. So I'm going to start by helping to reframe the conversation so that we can help you see Schwartz membership is an opportunity and not as a burden. So we want to talk about building a relationship with fundraising, marketing, and public affairs colleagues. Finally, I want to help you think about possible donors. We certainly don't expect you to um, re and solicit those donors, but we hope that you will help your fundraising team think about who some of them might be. We want you to think about how you can use the Schwartz Center membership and the Schwartz Center Round sessions as a way of thanking donors. Then we will look at the particular costs of membership and some suggested sponsorship amounts. And at the very end, we will um, introduce to you two donors who have been part of um, the Schwartz Center Rounds to a very important institution that was important to them and to their father. So it'll be a, a very moving case study that hopefully you can glean some, some new information from. So let's turn to the next slide. Uh, here I really wanted to focus on helping you frame your perspective. The center membership and the, the fees that are involved actually can be an opportunity for your institution, not a burden. Um, framing that perspective, we want to help the passion and the enthusiasm that you have for what you're already doing or for what you want to bring to your institution, and we want, to, want you to see all of the important work that you are doing can actually be a financial asset to your institution. Part of that will be through teamwork with the fundraising team at your institution. So let's take a look at the next slide. Um, here I want to emphasize that your 
pursuit of Schwartz Center membership, you're bringing the Schwartz Center membership to your institution, is actually an opportunity for your fundraising team. Um, uh, and I can say this having been in the fundraising business now for over 25 years, fundraisers need special projects. They need what you might think of as a hook to talk with a donor about. Uh, donors are usually very impassioned about the mission of their institution, but they're often looking for specific projects or specific ideas to attach their philanthropy to. So the more that you can help educate your fundraising team, the more uh, you will realize that Schwartz Center membership is actually a very compelling hook for donors at your institution. I could put it in, in, in sort of more crass business language. Fundraisers need something to sell. And Schwartz Center membership is something very uh, to sell. Um, I'm not going to linger on the cartoon, but that's just a little a little fundraising humor for you <laughs> at your leisure. <laughs> um, on the slide, again, I want to, to emphasize as much as I can with you that your ideas around Schwartz Center membership the opportunity Schwartz Center membership offers to institution will translate into donations. Uh, as, as you might be aware, I believe that some of you on the call are fundraisers. Uh, many of you are planning committee members. Um, but one of the things that, um, that, that you, know, you realize is that it's the idea, the passion that you bring to the table uh, value of compassionate care in your institution, value of the Schwartz Center Rounds program, uh, that is something that can be very compelling to donors and can translate into very tangible donations. So colleagues in the fundraising department, I believe, will be thrilled to hear from you. Um, I'll take a moment and define what I mean by fundraising colleagues. Uh, there are a number of, there, there's a number of uh, various lingo that people use when they talk about fundraisers. They might in your institution call the development department. They call it the advancement department. The fear being that money advances the institution because it underwrite your programs. Um, they talk about it as the fundraising department. Or in some hospitals, they actually set up a separate foundation that accepts the charitable donations. I, I actually talked recently to fundraiser who is, his title is executive director of the hospital's foundation. The word fundraising or development isn't even in his title. Uh, you want to you uh, think about how your particular institution um, talks about fundraising and, and what titles and what labels they give to fundraising. So let me um, move to the next slide and again just acknowledge here that some of you on the call I believe are prospective members. And um, so please know that your passion for what you want to bring to the institution is set as well. And that now is a perfect time, whether you've hosted the Schwartz Center Rounds for 10 or 15 years or whether you are trying to bring Schwartz Center membership to your institution next year, now is the time when you can build relationships with fundraising team at your institution. Uh, each of you, the spirit is trying to describe here that each of you has a picture of the puzzle. And if you can um, bridge between what you're doing on the clinical side and your uh, fundraising team, really help each other out and make a, a significant difference for your institution. So one of the first things you're going to want to think about as you build a relationship with the fundraisers at your institution is to identify the right fundraiser to talk to. For already have an existing relationship. Perhaps you already have um, a fundraising team member who comes and, and attends the Schwartz Center Round sessions. Um, if you do not, don't worry. Again, now is the time to start. My instinct is to start at the top, to start build that relationship with whomever is uh, holding that seat at the top of the department. Perhaps their title is Director of Development. Perhaps the title is executive director of your hospital foundation. You have to do that research, um, and hopefully you can find out that out fairly quickly in your staff directories. Of course, people at the top are pulled in a lot of directions. They're often the ones who are going out and meeting with donors multiple times a week. Uh, so it's possible 
that they might not hear back right away. Please do not be deterred. Do not take it personally. I think we all know our lives are incredibly busy. Each and every one of us is racing every moment of the day. So if you don't hear your back, take a look at that staff directory and reach out to somebody whose title might be major gifts officer, um, the next best place to go. Um, it's the fundraisers who are working directly with individual donors, and um, I'm confident that you will find someone who will be thrilled uh, once we get through the busyness of our everyday lives, who will be thrilled to hear from you and hear about the opportunity that you bring. Um, one well, of the next things to do after you've identified the right person to talk with is to educate that person or to educate members of the entire fundraising team on what center membership means, what's to your institution, what the value of being affiliated with a nationally known institution that promotes compassionate care. Um, the value is on hosting the Schwartz Center Rounds program and offering that monthly or bi-monthly opportunity to connect with colleagues. Um, and no doubt in my mind that um, when you bring your fundraising team into the loop, once you educate them on what Schwartz Center membership is, that they will be sold, especially if you can get them to attend a session. So the first idea I would have here is include as many members of your fundraising team on your distribution list. For you who manage regular email distribution lists, add them to it. Make sure, of course, that you reach out to them one, so that they understand why they're receiving this email in their inbox. But most importantly, if you can get them to join you at a session and, of course, remind them of the confidentiality, I bring um, donors to sessions as long as the uh, institution is comfortable with that and as long as we remind the donors or the prospective donors of the confidentiality of the conversation. So get your fundraising colleagues to join you at a session. There's no doubt in my mind they will be so impressed with your passion. They will be sold. Um, so let me play maybe and pass out the panel. Great. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, your information has been uh, very helpful and we'll be returning for, for more tips. But at this point, I just wanted to share um, some perspective on how our participants as individuals might be able to help development uh, colleagues identify specific grateful patients or clinicians. So here's just three different examples of how you as clinicians or members of your Schwartz Center Rounds planning committee might be able to help out. Picture, conjure up in your mind um, a patient who you interacted with. In this case, we have Mrs. Smith. Ms. Smith once made me promise that if there was anything she could do to help, I should ask her. If you are a physician leader or a clinician or a social worker on your planning team and you've heard of a patient who's um, offered some assistance, something that you can pass on to your development team. Another example, maybe this is more pertinent for our development colleagues. If you're aware of your hospital trustees, um, if they come or attend your Schwartz Center round, and they um, actually, we have one site that a trustee attends on a regular basis and is often seen um, with, with tears in her eyes. This is a potential donor um, and prospect. An classic example of an individual uh, is when Dr. Rosen was, was always passionate about patient-centered care. And his family is looking for a way to memorialize or honor his involvement at the hospital. And this is the specific case that we'll hear from in just a few moments. Next slide. So the ideas for um, hotel donors whoops, uh, to the next level. So first, we're thinking of individuals or families or uh, board members. The next is to think about institutional donors. And this is a common uh, way that we have heard 
of our, from our member sites, of our sites by lunches um, at local uh, dinners or restaurants across the street. So you might want to consider asking them, soliciting them for, for food to help nurture the body and the soul of the participants in the realm. So locating the uh, caterers who are nearby. A section might be companies that are interested in quality and safety initiatives can approach to see if they would be willing to sponsor or underwrite the following costs for the Schwartz Center Rounds program. And the last option is uh, similar to the uh, local outside caterer, you might think of the food service within your hospital or your institution and approach them to see if they would be willing to donate food for the session. We think that that has been a, a common practice in some of sites for either, for either the lunches or the breakfasts. Once again, just to um, put in the phrase of this partnership with any of these sponsors is a way to promote compassionate care, to nurture the providers, to support the caregivers within the institution at the same time as um, making impact on the institution at large. Next. Please. So I just wanted to make sure that you also heard that um, just as you might help your fundraising team about or brainstorm about donors. Again, I want to reiterate, we're not expecting or thinking that uh, members of the planning team would be soliciting, but simply passing on information, being kind of the ear to the ground, as it were, um, on addition to your fundraising colleagues. You can play a role in seeking donors. Very simple and small ways that you can make sure that local donors who are helping make that your Schwartz Center membership is vibrant are recognized. And of course, you know, we know that the national brand is important and making sure that your materials always reflect Schwartz Center membership. Uh, but there are many creative ways to thank and memorialize a donor. Uh, there's, a, there's a way to put uh, wording in all of your promotional materials. A, and you'll see an example later on as we get to the case study, a small box that was added to their monthly flyers. Um, that heard, uh, the um, you can also put tent cards on the tables as you, where you do serve food. You, and I've seen many uh, um, center round site do that. Um, and of course, you can do verbal announcements. So there are lots of little ways that you can make sure that the donor feels thanked and appreciated. And also, in some cases, they might want that extra visibility, especially if they're a local company or a local restaurant. Um, so you can easily promise that. Go to the next slide and um, talk about the nitty gritty, the cost of the membership. Um, and I'm going to present a somewhat contrarian position. I know it's awkward and I know it can be a little bit nerve wracking or scary to talk about money. I understand that. As a fundraiser, let me tell you that fundraisers actually get excited when we hear about bigger numbers. So again, <laughs> I know it's a little bit of a contrarian position, but I'm just going to get out there. Sometimes bigger is indeed better. Um, and that's because there are some donors out there who want to embrace and endorse something big. They're excited about a big vision. They get excited about something that is tied to compassionate care. They really want to make a difference. They have the financial resources to make a difference. If they're passionate about things like compassionate care, if they're passionate about that come to love and value at your healthcare institution. Actually, a bigger number could be more exciting for them because then they will feel like they're having even more impact. And let me reiterate this. You're doing donors a favor. Donors love to have impact. Donors want to make a difference. People who money, by large, want to know that they're helping in some way. So. As I say, a bigger number can help them feel that emotion even more deeply. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what some of these costs might be. And again, I'm not expecting here that you necessarily will be creating a budget per se. 
very often um, we talk with donors about a general sponsorship, which is a rounded number. But to help you understand what size that rounded number can be, you're going to want to help your fundraising colleagues understand and then do a back of the envelope budget. You want to understand what some of the direct costs are. So, of course, there is the membership or the initiation fee. Then you want to put a dollar a number around the lunch or the breakfast that you are serving clinicians. I talk a lot with donors about how during a short center round session, it gives the institution an opportunity to nurture the body as well as the soul. And then donors, well, depends. Donors eat that up. They yeah. love it. Um, so think about the cost of lunch. I've suggested here just an average per person cost of $8. You might be in a, an urban setting where it's perhaps $10 per person. But again, you can do some quick math. Let's say your, your round program um, sessions average 100 attendees, just using round numbers, 100 attendees, $8 a person, and maybe you host six sessions a year. You can just a quick number there. Perhaps your institute has internal charges, I don't know, and charges your department for room fees or for your visual expenses. Again, you know that more than I. But those are numbers that you can offer um, your raising team so that they can help put together a general sense of what it's costing you. Um, the amount of fundraiser can ask for will vary from donor to donor. So I don't hesitate to just think as comprehensively as possible. Let's take a quick look at the next slide here where um, our experience in working with member sites is sponsorships that other member sites have been able to uh, solicit from donors have ranged from, on an average, from 5,000 to 15,000. Again, it depends on your particular site, the number of sessions you host. It depends on whether you are joining and the initiation fee. If you've been a member for a while, might simply be talking about the membership, annual membership fee. So the numbers can differ. This, but numbers can differ from donor to donor as well. Start with your fundraising team with the big number possible and go from there. Um, you also decide to think about a budget that includes some staff time. So, for example, if you're considering joining the Schwartz Center, um, there's some initial training time. And you, you do some quick back of the envelope um, estimates. I'm going to go out on a limb here. I do not know what uh, an average uh, personnel number might be, but I'm just going to go out on a limb here and use some rounded numbers. Let's say you have someone who is, you know, a $50 an hour, a $30 an hour, a $20 an hour. You use some very quick numbers and come up. Again, your fundraising team can help you with an approximate average hourly cost for your staff time and use that as you project forward in terms of the, the investment and training and planning. Um, give you one uh, tangible example here. Our colleagues at Yale New Haven Hospital had a very unique situation. As it turned out, Ken Schwartz was a Yale graduate and they uh, had someone who was supportive of Yale New Haven Hospital who actually knew Ken Schwartz. I know, I understand that's a perfect storm that um, some of you, if you're in uh, California or Washington State, don't have that opportunity. Um, but still, I'm going to mention, because I think what reminds us all is that if their connection is not through Ken, their connection might be through a compassionate care experience that they received. Um, and so, uh, as you talk to your fundraisers, you reach out to your development department. In this instance, it was the physician leader who reached out to the development department. She said that he knew about this existing donor who can Schwartz through Yale. Talked about the average annual cost of holding the Schwartz Center membership at Yale in New Haven, and they decided to put forward a $10,000 request to this donor because that's how they kind of average the cost of the membership fee and the food, et cetera. And they understood in talking with this donor that the donor wanted to do something over time. They didn't want just a one-shot deal. They wanted to think about a long-term commitment. So the fundraising team actually advised they have a meeting with the donor and that the physician leader talk with them about the importance of winning the Schwartz Center Rounds membership in that institution over a period of time. 
and they're able to convince the donor to make, and you can, if you're all sitting down, to make a $100,000 commitment to the institution. It paid a year over 10 years, so it was $10,000 a year, and it was specifically restricted to supporting the sports center around membership at that institution. Uh, so it was a 10-year commitment, which roots the program in that institution for 10 years was extraordinary. A uh, physician leader has now left the institution, and he leaves knowing that the institution is in great if the short center rounds is not going anywhere. It is staying, and it is embraced by the senior leadership and the fundraising team at that institution. So just one example, uh, an exciting example. Pass back to Pamela. Well, thank you. Yeah. So uh, our next topic, and uh, we've alluded to our, our guest presenters who so graciously are giving up their time to join us today. Um, we have Janet Burdick Rosen, who is a professional fundraiser um, development professional for over the past 30 years, and uh, her sister Amy Burdick, who is also a healthcare professional with a background in medical social work and healthcare marketing. And with us today, um, they're the proud daughters of Dr. Daniel Burdick, who was a surgical oncologist and general surgeon in Syracuse, New York. He was affiliated with Upstate University Hospital and other Syracuse hospitals in the Syracuse University Medical School for over 40 years. And their wish um, with, and they're going to um, share their story, was to honor their father in an appropriate way. i turn it over to Janet and Amy. Thank you. Thank you, Antonia, for inviting us here today. Um, I think everything you've heard so far from our two speakers really resonates with both Amy and myself, and I think our example touches on a number of the things that you've already heard, um, but it's in the specifics that might give you some additional ideas for your institution. Um, so in, as Pamela mentioned in the introduction, um, Amy and I are two of five children, actually, of uh, uh, Dr. Daniel Burdick, who's Pixie on the screen, and um, his background has just been described. But um, we both live in the Boston area, have been here for uh, big amounts of time, um, but we grew up in Syracuse, and um, our father was obviously a very important part of our life over the years, both um, as a clinician, practicing clinician, and after he retired. And um, he, uh, we learned about the Schwartz Center rounds pretty directly. I think we probably read something about the program in the newspaper at one time shortly after it was established. And it resonated for us in learning about the, pro the, the center and the program because we knew that our father's life work and his mission um, was really all about compassionate caregiving. There was no Schwartz Center at the time he practiced. I think in one of his right after he retired, he actually shadowed and foresaw a program like this because he felt that the importance of empathy and compassion in caring for cancer patients, but all patients, was so important in how they how they did as, as patients. And so um, we learned a little bit about the Schwartz Center and about the Rounds program, and it was sort of in the back of our minds, and, and we may have attended a couple of events. Um, but it wasn't really front and center um, with our, in our lives until several years ago when our father passed away in 2012 at the age of 96. We have uh, since moved him and my, our mother to Boston. Um, and at the time, we um, were thinking about different ways that we could honor his memory, but in a way that was meaningful to us and to him. And um, so as we were thinking about different ideas, we also were um, aware that the, at the University Hospital in Syracuse, up to university, they were actually in a major fundraising campaign to build a new regional cancer center. And we had learned about that, and we actually had some conversations with some of the development folks, my background in development, about the campaign. And originally, I think the hospital was thinking and we were thinking, well, as you know, if you have a major building campaign, you have opportunities to honor people by naming a room or a space, and you can put up a plan and, and so forth. And they presented us with some options for that, but that didn't feel right to us as donors. We didn't feel like just putting his name on a plaque in a, some 
room for the amount of money we felt we could contribute, which wasn't a huge amount, was not really in keeping with what he would have wanted. So it, it occurred to us, um, and we brought this to the attention of the medical director at the hospital um, and um, a colleague I had developed a relationship with in the development office, asked them if they had ever heard of the Schwartz Center and the Rounds program, and to our surprise, they had not. Um, this is a major regional medical center, which um, we thought this, this program belonged at this hospital. It had to be there. <laughs> Sorry if I get a little emotional. But anyway, um, so we presented them with some information about the program. They were very excited to learn about it. It clearly resonated with us as, as prospective donors because it really spoke to um, our father's belief in compassionate caregiving. It spoke to them because they were about to open this major cancer center, knowing his background in oncology. And over time, in several conversations, we developed the video that we presented them of we would be willing to make a gift um, of an amount that would be sufficient from our knowledge of what these underlying costs were to fund at least the initial uh, cost to bring the program to the, to the hospital at, for at least the first year. We couldn't guarantee a continual source of income beyond that. We didn't have that capacity, but also had some ideas of reaching out to some of our father's family and friends and colleagues, professional colleagues, um, that they could contribute to, to this effort as well. And so what resulted from these conversations was um, the creation of a fund. We actually, um, as I worked with the development team, we were able to create a fund, his name, we, we called the Dr. Daniel Bird a Compassionate Care Fund. We didn't we knew that the Schwartz Center Rounds was a, you know, part of that name, but we created a fund in his name that um, allowed the hospital to remember him and his life's work in the course of bringing this program to this hospital. And I think it's now in its third year of operation. Um, we've been getting regular reports from the planning team at, um, at the Ed Upstate about how well, I, I don't remember how many were at the first session, but it's grown. I think they have probably five or six sessions a year, as most hospitals do. And um, Amy will tell you in a second about her ability to attend the first round session. But also, um, in in these initial conversations, we talked about ways that we could help them promote his legacy through publicity, as Tanya has alluded to, um, as this program was being publicized. And the what was reassuring and just really um, so rewarding for us is when we attended the opening of the new cancer center uh, about a year later, um, that I think it was the president of the hospital um, came to us and said that he was so touched by the, the impact that this round had, he was committed to provide hospital funding out of the hospital's budget, at least as long as he was president, to continue the program. So fortunately, we couldn't make the $100,000 ten-year commitment, but um, um, there, we have been continual gifts from other donors to, to sustain his fund and sustain his memory at the hospital. And I think we might have slide with um, a few examples of, of some publicity that um, these are just a few things where we worked with their um, uh, marketing department and he was a graduate of Upstate Medical uh, Center. So the alum magazine did a piece, um, the newsletter that the medical director uh, about, promoted on when it was first established. Uh, there was a, a tagline in the center of, of, of uh, this is a flock promoting one of their programs, and um, they also had a, uh, included an article on their website about when the fund was established. So this was a way, a win-win, both for the hospital to promote the fact that they had this new program and to provide some recognition uh, to, uh, to, to uh, live for our father's memory to live on. I'll this now over to Amy, and she just is going to add a few thoughts from her perspective. Sure. Yeah. So um, we recognize that our family situation may be somewhat unique and that, um, you know, most potential donors don't have a family member who's a cancer surgeon and a family member who's a fundraiser and, and someone's a medical social worker and a health care marketer um, who also happen to be familiar with the short center round. But what's not unique, um, we believe, is the desire of patients and families to give back to the hospital uh, in their community that was meaningful to them, or to show their appreciation for care that they received, honor the memory of a loved one through donation to the hospital. And in our case, we want to honor our father through a program that would keep the memory alive. 
and that would directly benefit the caregiving team that was so important to him. Uh, and I was able to attend the first uh, Schwartz and Rounds program at, um, at Upstate University Hospital in Syracuse and was just very, very powerfully moved by that program. And um, to put marketing hat on for just a minute, you may be wondering, well, how do you find these patients and families like us who want to support your program? And that's, as Tanya has said, that's where your fundraising team comes in. Um, they know who, they, who donors are, and they need a good cause that the donors will embrace. And having attended um, a short center rounds personally myself, um, I am confident that if anyone from your fundraising team attended one of these rounds, um, you, would, you would never have to worry <laughs> about finding the funds for this program again. It's extremely powerful. And you do this work every day. You may take it for granted, but um, it's extremely valuable. Thank you so much, um, Amy and Janet. Your your personal passion obviously comes through, and uh, it's a wonderful example of successful donor sponsorship. So, so thank you, Tanya, Pamela, Amy, and Janet. Wow, wonderful, inspiring ideas and insights. We really appreciate your time and your experience and energy. I'd like to um, ask our participants. If you have a question, please hover your cursor over the green tab found in the top of your screen and click on the chat box, and we'll answer as many questions as we can. Um, we've received a couple questions, starting with, do you need to wait to raise funds until you've been a member of the Short Center for a few years and can show a donor measurable results in your own institution, or can you raise funds before you even become a member? And we'll turn this over to Pamela and Tanya. Sure, this is me again. I'll just chime in that I firmly believe that you can find a donor based on your own stories of the compassionate care that your institution delivers and what you want to achieve by becoming a member of the Schwartz Center and becoming part of a national movement. So I think uh, you can help a donor just understand it from that emotional point of view. But there are, of course, some donors who uh, are inspired by the emotion, but then the metrics. You know, they, they start with the emotional part of their brain, but then they need the rational part of their brain to validate. And so um, I do think that you can use the metrics that we have here at the Schwartz Center. You know, we have 20 years of running the Schwartz Center rounds program nationwide. So we have evaluations from member sites every year. We've conducted two national um, evaluations of the program. So we do have very, very specific data on the benefits of being affiliated with the Schwartz Center and on the benefits of having your interdisciplinary team attend the Schwartz Center Rounds program on a regular basis and certainly provide those metrics to you. So do wait. Start now. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Um, so I know you mentioned this in your presentation, but uh, there's a question of, are you expecting Rounds leaders to go out and raise funds uh, to solicit donors? You might restate. Uh, sure, yeah. sure. I will be happy. This is Tanya again. I'll be happy to restate that. I guess my my firm belief is for those of you who are out there doing wonderful work that uh, choked me up <laughs> and had you almost crying yeah. here in the room. Uh, for those of you who are doing that wonderful work, that that your role can be to educate the fundraising team in your institution, make them aware of the program. Frankly, share your passion. Um, share why you are so inspired to be a part of a compassionate care team at your institution and be part of a compassionate care movement nationwide. I do believe your fundraising colleagues will be thrilled, as I said before, to take it from there. Um, the Schwartz Center Rounds program and membership is very passionate, is very powerful, you are passionate. That tells itself, again, to use a crass business phrase. Um, but small reminder, I think that you can brainstorm with your fundraising team, you can them Unhand, as it were, um, they might ask for you, and I know this was the case at Yale New Haven. They asked the physician leader to sit down with the donor and describe the program. They also brought the donor to a Schwartz Center round session. So they ask you to sit down and meet with the donor. Perhaps that's something you've already done with a fundraising team for something else. Um, but let them do all the other nuts and bolts. You share the passion, and that's your main role. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That's great. Um, could you uh, 
tell us what the typical cost of a beginning the program if you take into account the dues, the training costs, dedicated staff, et cetera. You kind of cover that. Any other comments about? Sure. Do you want me to do it? I can do a kind of quick back of the envelope budget if that's helpful. Yeah, that'd be great. I, again, I know that your fundraising team can do it more scientifically, but just just to present some rounded numbers, let's say that you are a prospective member of the Schwartz Center and you're thinking about becoming a member of the Schwartz Center. So you got that initiation fee looming ahead of you, um, $700 initiation fees. So let's start with that at the top of this little anatomy ledger in our minds. Then think about two clinicians who participate in orientation and training. Your orientation and training is, let's, let's call it four hours, and those two clinicians are going to travel. So again, I suggested earlier that you, your fundraising team comes up with some brush uh, average of what the staff time might uh, quantify as. And use some math, and you could be looking at six, seven hundred dollars. Um, uh, of course, if, you're, if you have to travel to this orientation and training, depending on how far removed you are from where that's taking place, there might be overnight, there might be flight. So again, I'm going to do a broad brush number and add a five hundred dollars to this. Um, and then you're talking about some initial planning team meetings for your team. Uh, let's say you've got six members on your initial um, planning committee and one-hour planning meetings, and you have four of them. You dig, again, you do the quick math, six full, some average number that you come up with um, for your staffing, um, times four hours of meetings, and you might get a number that's around $1,500. Before you know it, you are looking at a potential sponsorship here of $10,000. Um, that is not including what you would, might project forward if you are indeed in a position where you can have food at the sessions, which we do recommend. So that's just for the initial typical cost of beginning a program with the training, the potential travel, the step and the initiation fee. It can go up from there. I'm going to put it to panel. Great, thank you. So before, I know we have received uh, at least one more question. Uh, before we go on to that, I'd love to put out there uh, the offer. If anyone has additional questions, please feel free to type that into your chat box and sit on in. Thanks, Pamela. Well, what are the best predictors that identify that the Schwartz rounds are working and promote long-term sustainability? Thank you. I will answer that one. In terms of the best predictors for successful uh, programs, I would say that some of the best predictors are um, three. Old. One is that um, you have senior level uh, support so that there's senior leadership buy-in in uh, valuing and understanding the impact of Schwartz Center membership and the short center rounds. Second thing would be, I hate to base it just on numbers, but on um, your multidisciplinary attendance. You consistently, even in the initial few sessions, um, have a nice representation of physicians, nurses, spiritual care, frontline providers, um, food services, uh, Housekeeping staff members, if you have folks from different areas of your uh, institution, it's a great predictor of a successful Schwartz Center round. And the third one is a little bit less tangible, but I call it um, palpable uh, energy and enthusiasm. Quite often, we can just tell um, from the energy level of the planning team and the attendees um, that when a Short Center Round session is wrapping up and people, the buzz is there, that's a great predictor of the success of the Short Center uh, Rounds and Short Center membership. Well, I don't think we have any further questions coming in. Uh, what I'd like to do is ask Tanya if she has anything she'd like to add, comments. Simply that I know you can do it. <laughs> You've got the passion already. I know you can build those uh, relationships 
with your fundraising team, and I know that they will be thrilled, even if they're initially a little busy, they will be thrilled to get involved and, and uh, hear about your passion. And I know that this will show, as you talk about the senior level support, Pamela, and how important that is as a predictor of long-term success, I know that your ability to share your passion with your fundraising colleagues will be yet another proof positive to that senior leadership team that being a member of the Schwartz Center and being involved in compassionate care at your institution uh, is a great financial asset to your institution as well as being a human asset to, to the uh, support you're each other and the support you're giving your patients. I also can't uh, pass by the opportunity to um, thank Tanya for the fundraising that she does for the Schwartz Center, which is a significant, and I mean really significant, uh, 83% of our funds are raised by our development team, and they are awesome. So, um. Can I make actually one more point? I'm sorry about that. Um, but that is just to remind you guys that, um, and it might be hard to remember this, but actually a, a full, uh, I believe the number is 84% of the costs of running the Schwartz Center membership program are actually underwritten by philanthropy to the Schwartz Center. So membership fees and initiation fees are actually, a, they seem big. On your end, they are actually a small percentage of the full cost of our running the membership program, and its donors to the Schwartz Center help make that possible and help keep the fees at level that they are. I know that there can be a wonderful partnership here between our fundraising and the funding you're going to be able to do at your institution to, to really, um, I don't know, better. Drive and drive. <laughs> right. And in what I would like to say is, is um, how helpful this information has, has been, and we certainly hope it has been helpful to our participants. Um, but I'd like to also and remind folks about how impactful the Schwartz Center membership can be and how um, powerful the Schwartz Center Rounds program is. And truth. It is an incredibly cost-effective program to support caregivers, to improve teamwork, to decrease stress and isolation. If we look at these budgets, and we're truly talking about $10,000 per year, many institutions and many consultants or other interventions would have a um, price tag that way is, uh, is far above and exceeds a $10,000 per year fee. So we hope this has been really helpful. I'm going to pass the mic back to uh, Lynn. Let's see. Uh, let's see. What, do we have time for this one question? Uh, when you talk about training people, can you drill down on what that, that material is? Yeah, well, quick answer. A uh, quick answer. In terms of training, uh, we have a very uh, detailed onboarding process. Um, we provide our regional consultants work with each of our prospective members. We do have uh, materials that are provided, but the actual in-person training and orientation is about three to four hours off-site at a current existing member site. Um, sometimes that's in driving distance, sometimes it's a flight away, depending graphically on where you are. With three to four hours, um, it can be rounded out to one day of in-person training and orientation. And then the rest of the uh, training is through conference calls and consultation uh, uh, visits with a regional consultant. Superb. Thank you so much. I just want to uh, end with, by saying, number one, thank you to all of our presenters and panelists for your wonderful insights and inspiration. It's truly really terrific. Uh, and that to let our participants know that we'll be sending out a brief survey shortly, seeking your feedback on this webinar. We appreciate your responses, which will help us to plan our future sessions. Please photos of innovative ideas, uh, your um, screenshots to Juanita Guimera our member services coordinator, whose email address will be um, in follow-up on the survey. And um, also on the last slide is contact information for Tanya Holton and her phone number and her email address, who is our director of development, who would be happy to talk to individual 
um, members of the, of the and participants today. Um, and lastly, to say thank you to Juanita Gaimera for her technical support, who keeps us um, plugging along here. Um, thank you for setting aside time for your busy day to participate. We appreciate it. And that concludes today's program. Thank you.